There we are. Welcome to the listening. Liam Murphy. How are you, sir? Or where are you? I always like to find out where people are because I've no idea where you are. Okay, I'll do the where. I'm uh, I'm in Norfolk. Uh, I'm in a village called Heatherset, a very big village um, in kind of South Norfolk. Okay, that's funny because I thought you might be somewhere completely different, but we're both in Norfolk. That's, we are. I, yeah. I thought we might be, but yeah. So I was over, where was I today? East, is it Carlton? Oh, I can't remember. Yes, there is such a place not too far from here. Is it sort of not far from Wyndham as well? It's Wyndham, Mulbarton, those kinds of places. Oh, so I was over your way today then. You, you were very <laughs> close to me, yeah. You're oh, about geez. four miles away. All oh, right. Wow. So how long have you been there? Because I'm I'm picking up a bit of an accent from the north. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I like that. I like that. Um, I have a running sort of uh, joke with various friends who call me a soggy Midlander, and I I insist that I'm from the north, but actually they're right. Um, because I'm I came here from Nottingham. Okay, Nottingham. That's what it is. So uh, yeah, I know I I have. I have been in Norfolk since 1995, actually. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, it's a while. This I cross over this year. This year, I think it's sorry. No, next year, I get to the point where I spent as much time here as I was, kind of where I was born. You know. So it's yeah, yeah. Suddenly, fifty-fifty. Wow, amazing. So Nottingham. Did you? So is that where you spent the first half of your life then? Yeah, I I left, well, I kind of left Nottingham a few times and did various things, Um, but I left and did not return when I was 26, I think, and I came came to Norwich to do a fine art degree, actually, which kind of came and found me uh, almost by surprise. I I, I hadn't actually, it it was a weird one because I hadn't actually applied to do that that year um in fact i was traveling around ireland with with a an ex-met policeman and city broker who decided to turn into a kind of uh, you know traveling hippie and we we were off on, on a bit of an adventure trail um and i was staying in a youth hostel in in dublin and i got I actually got a telegram in 1995. I can't can't think of how else I got the information, but my my mum got a written message and got some some. I think it was a telegram through to this international youth hostel, and they said they want you on this degree course. And I said I don't know what you're talking about because I haven't even applied. You know, so it was one of those odd moments in life where everything changed because we we were heading off to South Africa, wow. and I came to Norwich instead. So hang on a minute. So what they randomly pick you? There must have been. You must have done well, something. No, it, it's not. It wasn't. It wasn't. No, you're right. It wasn't a total coincidence. I had applied there two years before. Right. And I found out afterwards that somebody had picked up some drawings somewhere, and they they were a bit short on entrance, I think. And somebody on an interview panel had said, "Well, these don't look too bad." <laughs> and, and I must have put my phone number or, or an address on the back of them, and they they literally got in touch. Um, uh, so that was how it happened. But obviously, I, I had not had any intention of going there. I thought they didn't want me. So, so what were you thinking of doing instead? Just traveling, or or did you have something else in mind? Yeah, no, I'd got uh, finally sort of worked myself up to a bit of a wander, you know, wanderlust. Twenty six, kind of thought, right, world's your oyster for a bit, and I was very happy to live hand to mouth and have a bit of an adventure. Um, and actually what happened was I came here and uh, m- met the the now mother of my children. And within three months, she was pregnant. And we had two, oh. kids. We had two kids. People say, what did you do at art school? And I say, well, I made babies. Yeah. Conception. <laughs> <laughs> Conception. Wow. So that was, yeah. So your creativity was, uh, was in full effect. <laughs> That's a very euphemistic way of putting it. Yes. Great. Wow. Well, so a very, um, yeah, quite a, quite a turnaround from what you thought you were going on a journey, but it wasn't the one that you, uh, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, There's definitely seemed to be moments in life when 
almost regardless of what happens, you know, some some things in the in in the ether or in the offing. So that that was one of them. So when you 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 did a fine art course, was it a specific um, course like painting, sculpture, or was it a general kind of fine art? No, it was actually that quite kind of old fashioned, really, for for 1995, um, when most art courses were going into kind of combined arts and new media and stuff. Um, but Norwich was very traditional and still had a printmaking studio and a painting and a sculpture studio, uh, none of which really interested me at the time. I was more kind of in, in my head and wanted to, to make you know, I, I probably would have been more interested in conceptual art and installations and, and things, but but I came to, uh, uh, technically I enrolled on a fine art painting course, which um, was it was interesting, but it didn't really suit me at the time. That's very, very interesting to me because I started um, a fine art painting course at St. Martin's in London in 1994. Hmm. Um, and I did everything but paint when I was there. Mm. Uh, you know, it was, yeah, it was very much sort of performance, installation, events, and, you know, kind of everything, just mixing it all up. Mm. Great. Um, yeah, but, but it's only now, after many, many, many years, that I've remembered, oh, it was painting that <laughs> really got you excited as a child, like, you know, I can remember the first, the first time I really came across art, apart from sort of seeing a, a, a print of something on somebody's wall or mm. was, we had a, I grew up in Manchester, part of Manchester called Salford, which is a kind of borough of Manchester and a part of Salford called Swinton. Oh yeah. Which. Where the building had, societies are from. What's that? Yeah, exactly. That sort of thing. Insurance company. Um, L.S. Lowry, in fact, yes. Penbury was. They were his kind of the streets where he was wandering yeah. around painting. Yeah. But um, and in fact, it was some of his work that I first saw. There was this god awful sort of shopping precinct in the seventies that we mm. used to go to every Saturday to get various things, and they had a there was a building called the Lancastrian Hall, which was a sort of civic center. Um, it had a library, it had sort of function rooms. Mm. On the ground floor, as you walked in, there was just one room, which was a gallery, a square room with paintings all around. Mm. And every Saturday we'd go to the library and I'd just go in there on my own, and just stand yep. there and, and be, there was something about the paintings that really spoke to me or, or really kind of drew me in. And that was it. That was when it started. And I didn't really know what it was and there was no context and nobody around me was interested in art. So there was no conversation to be had. It was just this kind of experience. Mm. And it was this thing that pulled, I just had to go in there. There was something about being in that room and seeing those things that felt really good in a kind of very visceral way. It was very familiar, strangely. Can I tell you my little anecdotal story, which sort of ch chimes with that um, on a different level? But I, I actually, I, I love Ellis Lowry's drawing uh, more than, I, I mean, sure, if I'd grown up in Salford, I might have a stronger feeling for his painting, but there's plenty of bits of Nottingham and North, you know, we, we, we were in a mining belt. So you, you, you kind of understand what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About. There's a similar feeling to a lot of those towns, I think, because they were all profoundly changed by the industrial yeah. revolution, weren't they? So, but but the fact the fascinating fascination with, um, I had a similar experience with a very unusual little uh, uh, what was basically a gallery, in a place you'd never expect to find a gallery. It was actually it turned into a. Uh, an off license <laughs> for several years on this kind of council believe it or not it was on a council estate in nottingham um always and the, the weird thing is i used to go to this place because it, i had an i had an aunt and an uncle who were quite elderly we go and visit them at once every month or so and being an only child i would be really bored 
with the conversation. Mm. So by the time I'd kind of scrumped the pears and the apples and done whatever I could find, I would walk up the road and the first place I came to, and there was actually a shop beside it, but they had this room that was just a gallery space. And, and to me, I mean, you know, I was kind of like four, five, six, seven maybe, but really, really young. And even the concept of going into a gallery and looking at pictures, it was like you didn't have to buy anything. It was just this place you could walk in and just look at stuff yeah. and then you could walk out again. Now, a very odd thing happened about, um, I don't know if I was 40 years later, actually, I, I opened my own gallery, cut, cut forwards quite a, a, you know, a long story cut short. Um, and I called it for, for practical reasons, gallery 133, because the number on the door was 133. Mm -hmm. It was as simple as that. And I was kind of going along with this business and I had a little framing business and I ran a gallery for a bit. And one day a guy came in from Nottingham and he said to me, when we talked, and he said, like you, he, he noticed the accent, which was the same as his, and he, he said, you're not from around here, are you? And I said, no. And he said, Nottingham. Yeah. And he said, well, did you name it after Gallery 133? No. So that's... And, I, and, and the weird thing was, I said, no, I, I didn't, but I, I don't know what you mean. And then he explained this gallery space to me. And now I'm telling you these memories, yeah. <clears throat> but until he walked into my gallery called Gallery 133, I'd never had those memories. In 40 years, wow. I hadn't remembered that I used to walk into this place and see really? these. So yeah. you'd forgotten completely that that had ever happened? I never had an experience like it. And I was actually a bit overwhelmed because, you know, when somebody gives you something out of your childhood, and just like that, mm. I suddenly, the light came on <clears throat> and I had this memory, but as if I was, you know, five years old. Wow. And it was very, very peculiar. Um, <clears throat> I had to go and take, take a minute. It doesn't uh, exist. It never existed. It's it's some kind of other dimensional place that just opened up. <laughs> and, then, and this guy, he just kind of came from that place too, just to sort of remind you of something like that. I, I, it's amazing. That's very reassuring. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's something really beautiful and rich in that idea of this gallery in the middle of nowhere on a council estate. I love that. I think you could, I mean, there's a whole, that's like a whole film or something, but I love it that somebody obviously who was living there mm. was into art and you know, it, it kind of makes me think of something I, I was considering quite a lot a few years back, which was there are all these amazing people who go through life that that touch people in their local area or or have an effect but they never become well known or famous mm. but they're incredible people and the world is full of them all the time and and this was something i had a friend who died quite young um a really close friend who was important in my sort of time at art college and you know that very turbulent time in life the 20s he was like he was like my brother who wasn't blood but felt like he was in a way i did read i had a look actually i did read you, you kind of wrote was it a sort of an obituary it was a more of a, like a tribute wasn't it but yeah i mean i made it we made it we made a book actually me and another friend who was a designer after he mm. died because mm. it this was the period just before um internet and email took off fully and we used to write letters to each other because he was still in Salford and I was down in London but he was always coming down and hanging out and he almost kind of spent as much time at art college there as I did because he was always there getting involved um, and we used to write and send poems and drawings and backwards and forwards all the time and you know all kinds of weird things in the post and so when he died I suddenly had, I, re, I realized that, well, I've got all these letters. I've kind of got a whole kind of fragmentary mm. record of him. And he mm. was an amazing per person. He was one of those people that, mm. you know, he probably wouldn't have ever become really famous or well known for anything. But everybody he met, he had some kind of effect on. Mm. 
mm. not always for the good you know <laughs> he was a bit of a rogue as well but mm. um yeah but 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 then after that i sort of became a bit fascinated by that idea and i think about you know even people who were well known someone like sid barrett say who kind of went off yep. into obscurity and he probably you know, I think he lived in a council estate somewhere. I don't know where it was towards the end of his life and became completely unknown. Well, well the stories about him are that he he really wasn't very consequential after, I, I suppose, after he'd done quite a lot of drugs. But the bits that I've read and people who, one or two people who kind of claim to have known him or sort of seen him around, I don't think anybody knew him that, that well. Um, he had the opposite arc, didn't he? He kind of went from being yeah. notorious to being being something else. But he did. He, he always said he didn't want it anyway. So yeah, exactly. But that's what I feel. I feel like there are there's a whole set of people who kind of see through all of that as well, and maybe do have something incredible, but it it's kind of it's not for general broadcast. It's just for one on one meetings or a small community and. I know, well, I think, I, it, it just kind I of think opens it up that whole thing of, you know, it's not just about well-known people. And if you're not well-known, you're not worth something. Because we all know that, of course, that's bullshit. And, you know, we know hundreds well, I, of people. Do you think we all know that? Or do you think... Well, I, I, think starting probably, to that? I think probably we do. But, you know, it, okay. like anything, you know, it's like we all know politics is fucked and they're idiots and we all know corporations are destroying the earth but we still all kind of somehow play the game but i think everyone in their hearts knows these truths you know i think people subliminally uh young younger people especially uh, i'm counting on uh, you know i'm drawing from my own experience when the ego is probably a little bit less under control um it's easy to fall into the trap of believing that people's celebrity is justification of their value you know or some kind of i think you'd only learn that actually when you get a little bit older that celebrity is just is a as you say actually it's a completely incidental thing and i i think about it slightly differently i really think almost anybody could be a celebrity you know i don't because i don't think there's anything special in celebrity at all and so when when you're talking about your friend it, it's just really incidental to to whatever was special about him you know the the celebrity to, to, to me is is just you know it's just just incidental yeah yeah no that makes sense to me too absolutely yeah and i think well all of that is is kind of shifting anyway with all the other changes that are going on right now i think the um those particular cultural ways of being are coming undone that's what i <laughs> and there's there's more interesting richer deeper things that that are surfacing that's my hope as well you think we're pulling down the monoliths i think they're falling down i think i think mm -hmm. that you don't need to you just need to step out of the way and make sure you don't get squashed <laughs> uh, yeah, that, i mean that's what i'm feeling i'm feeling like it's more like green shoots are appearing and big old crumbling institutions are falling over. Mm. Lots of cracks appearing and that's opportunity true. to well, there's no denying that. That's that's a, a tangible, it's not a mystical thing, is it? You know, it's dead. No, no, it's British it's, home it's, stores, yeah. the whole retail industry, uh, you know, it's it's big institutions, countries and all of it. It's I mean, an incredible time. It's kind of we you know we we saw it i guess lots of people saw this a long time ago and saw it coming but it's mm. i feel like it's becoming evident even to the most kind of uh denialist well no just just people who are so immersed in the story of it right. of it being what how it is yeah that even to those people i think it must mm. be because the if you imagine the sort of image of our way of life has become so thin so mm. thin that it's it's almost transparent now and it's ripping and you can put your finger through it and i think it's getting harder and harder to maintain a sense of normality or especially in the last year that kind of 
fucked it good and proper, I think. Well, yeah. well, well, it's nice to meet somebody who, who feels that, and I get the impression that you see that as a positive thing as well. It's because it's this kind of thing that was happening, needs to happen, yeah. might sting a bit, you know, it might cause some problems. But well, it, it may kill us all in its, on its well, way out, that, but, it, but it... Form. But if it doesn't yeah. go, if it doesn't go, it's going to kill us all anyway. So yes. it's like, well, at least there's a chance <laughs> we make it if it falls apart quick, you know. Well, what's weird is that suddenly it seems like, although I think a lot of people are paying lip service, that that what you've just said there is becoming a, a kind of normal thing, you know, with the Extinction Rebellion and it, 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 that's becoming the, the everyday story. But how how bizarre i mean what incredible thing you know that, that most people on the planet are, are acquiescent to the idea that um the end could be nigh yeah i mean this is the stuff of you know it's hg wells and <laughs> yeah it's bizarre isn't it? you can't write a dystopian fiction is that yeah i mean you know and it it, on my kind of on my less yeah. sort of sane days oh hello Speaking of dystopian fiction um, um on my less sane days, I think this this is is actually some kind of super advanced virtual reality video game that I'm in because it just seems too mm. coincidental that these things are happening at this point now and I happen to be here alive. It almost it's like all the ingredients are there for this just to be like the latest um, super addictive video game that you play that just happens to last for, you know, 70 odd years or <laughs> I don't know, sometimes, you know, when I really feel like maybe I am losing my mind, um, I think perhaps this isn't real, perhaps, you know, and this whole idea of um, that, that's this, your reassuring thought when you're yeah, yeah. <laughs> worried about losing your mind. Yeah, you know, I'll just unplug at the end and go, fucking hell, that was great. Can I, can I start again? Can I choose life? You know, and, and this is where reincarnation comes from, these ideas, because you've actually played the game before. And, um, it, you know, the world's that mad now that anything seems pretty reasonable to me, <laughs> including that. So I think, yeah, I, I kind of agree with you. I, I think it's relative as well, though. I, I think it, there's, another, there's a slightly different take on that where, where you could look at, we've had this sort of global sense of security, um, <clears throat> although we had the Cold War and, you know, we kind of gone on a long time, really, 1945 till now is a long time not to have a world, you know, we, a lot of people would say we had loads of conflicts, you know, the wars yeah, never we just, ended. We, we had, just did them elsewhere. Remote. We had Vietnam, we had Korea straight away. I, I know, I, I realise there's all that. But still, the, the the culture that you and I live in, which is the Western, mm. we we probably have a much over a much more overdeveloped sense of security because security's been that's what the Cold War was. You know, it's it's been all about creating a feeling of security uh, for for the people that won the war, actually, because that's part part of it. Uh, and now we're getting because we felt you know these things are always relative. So because you felt so secure, when suddenly a lot of the prophecies and, and some of the fringe ideas that seemed to be um, you know out there start coming true, uh, that sudden turnaround, you know, and and the idea that all this new wealth is cryptocurrencies and you know the internet suddenly taking on there's more more wealth in things that don't actually exist than there is in stuff you know and, and 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 you put all that together i think relatively this the sense of insecurity is magnified massively because we were just too we were we we manufactured a feeling of security you yeah know, i don't know i mean i i see that i see that that that, that was going on but i never felt it because i remember i mean i've i've sort of all my adult life i felt like we're fucked because of the you know because of what we were doing to the environment even yeah even well it was happening before i was born you you were uh, born to the fringes yeah and also i remember in the 80s growing up as a sort of sort of young teen and teenager mm. it, to us it we thought we were all going to die in a nuclear war i mean there was that period where it seemed like it was actually going to happen and mm. i remember being in school in high school and us thinking this is it and and how how 
disturbing that was you know at that age or or i felt it's really deeply like you know well i suppose it depends for, for each and every individual yeah, sure. at, at what age and in what way you become politicized and and aware i for, for me one of the first very real things my, my, i was sort of partly raised by my granddad who who was in the second world war and so even though, you know, 90, in 1984, the proximity is, is not so distant at that point, to me, it was a million miles away. Sure. And war was a thing that might happen on some distant shore, but it wasn't anything to do with us. And I, I remember, I th presumably it was 82, I think the Falklands War was, was kind of mm -hmm. bubbling under. And I remember getting home from school and I, so, so I'm sort of 13 years old, something like that, and switching the, the black and white telly on. And um, uh, there was this announcement, we are at war, you know, and I, and I only knew the kind of Churchill speech and I wasn't politicized. And I remember being absolutely petrified. And that was probably the first moment when I politics sort of dawned on me, you know, that, that something big happened. And it can it can actually affect you in your living room. I never really felt connected to the big stuff mm. till I was until that that moment actually it frightened me to death. Right. And I was on my I remember being on my own in the house thinking, what does this mean? We're at war, you know. And I, right. I only had my kind of granddad. The, the Second World War was the reference. So I thought, Jesus, this is going to be bad. <laughs> well, it wasn't good. Mm. Where was where was your granddad in the war? Where was he fighting? Then? Was he? um there's a lovely way to to uh you, you can experience that by finding gary lineker's um bbc documentary because by some strange coincidence gary lineker's grandfather who although he was about 15 years younger than mine served in the same medical corps in the same regiment and made the same journey had the same war experience all the way from north africa through monte Cassino, back through italy later on in the war uh, towards dj d-day was one of the d-day dodgers um and was also at dunkirk earlier on um uh, but my my granddad was a kind of career he'd been in the war army for 10 years oh. and he he was in the army for cricket when people asked him what what were you doing in the army he said i was teaching king farouk to play cricket <laughs> <laughs> so he's a bit of a cricketer then yes he i think he was good a... did he play did he ever play he was great yeah he was he's, i've got various newspaper clippings he would have played for england really because the army 11 was probably better than the england 11 for obvious reasons you know everybody was in the army um yeah he was he was proper mm. Interesting. So you say you were partly raised by him. How much? How much of your childhood was he kind of the main man then? Uh, between the ages of about four, five, kind of school ages, really, because um, I would just go back to his place uh, af after school, and I would spend all the holidays there. You know, working parents and what have you. Yeah, yeah. So I was very lucky to have him, and uh, yeah. So most of it. Right, right. Yeah, that's it's often a special relationship, that one, isn't it? You know, between grandparents and grandchildren. Or certainly, you know, that I mine weren't local to where I grew up, but I do remember those times going to stay and how important they were on reflection. Mm -hmm. And often now when I think about them as people. Mm. there's a lot of similarities there's a lot of kind of characteristics about them and qualities they had and even skills and interests and things which i see in myself mm. and there was a kind of mirroring there in a way that maybe with my parents it wasn't there you know i picked up different things from my parents sort of more kind of maybe more sort of personal habits or traits i don't know but yeah it's interesting that I feel like that's such a, a valuable time, especially maybe, I mean, as a boy with your grandfather, that there's something, there's something about masculinity that they've got to show you as well, just by being, mm. you know, just by hanging out. 
it's, mm. not even, it's not even explicit. I feel like there's something about just hanging out with older men. You learn something about being a man. I got to know a lot of card games. <laughs> Did you? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. God, that seems like such a long time ago now. Like a, a totally different world, different universe. Yeah. When I reflect on, you know, 70s, 80s, it's almost a different... Incredibly so. Yeah, it just doesn't even seem like the same world or universe or anything. Well, I was having that conversation with a friend just last night, actually, who was talking about his own father, who was a lot older than him. So a bit like, you know, he's a bit older than me, so kind of probably our grandparents' age. And... Um, and, you know, we were just reflecting. I mean, it's obvious because it's just numbers, I know. But but the fact that your my memory, say, of sitting down with my grandfather and playing sevens or poker or something at his dining room table in, let's say, 1975, is, is only 30 years after the war ended. Mm. And yet the time from then to, to now, which is much more you know you got to you, you add another 10 years on um you get i mean when i reconstruct that the little the personal things like you say the ticks and and the, the things you remember about the individual it's a weird thing because you almost get closer to them as an adult because you understand all the the wider stuff that was affecting them you know and uh, that that's very interesting that's that's a sort of passage of time and and uh, you know, just just experience, just just learning the way big things have a, have a, an influence. You know, right right down. I mean, silly as it sounds, to to re I just took it for granted that he played cards. You know, he's my granddad. He plays cards all the time. But then you talk to people in the army and you think about what the experience of war was like, and they'll tell you it's 95 percent waiting for something bad to happen. Yeah. And five percent something really bad happening. Yeah. What do you do? Well, you play cards, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and he I mean, he knew a hell of a lot of card games. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so interesting that generation, because I never I never heard anything about the war from my grandfather and mm -hmm. and I had a grandpa and a granddad. And you know, my granddad had a wound on his leg, that was it. And they mm. were both in North Africa and they were both in the Royal Engineers, I think. Well, that was it. There was never, none of that stuff was ever talked about in any way at all. No, nor to me. No, I heard yeah, about it. Wasn't, it just wasn't what you did. No, you, no, you didn't you, talk about it. You didn't, nobody talked about it. Nobody, mm. it wasn't mentioned. It just wasn't, it, it was kind of there in the background. In some ways, I feel like it was there in a sort of negative, in a kind of mirror image, in an opposite, because I always felt like they had a tremendous sense of enjoyment of the simple things in life, that mm. was probably because they went through hell and they saw what hell looked like really fucking close up. That, that definitely computes, yes. And so that just the simple play, like growing stuff in the garden, making food, there was a real sense of just the enjoyment of life that I got from my grandparents, mm. all of them, in fact, male and female. That, yeah, just well, the, 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 we, we've got a bit stuck on grandparents, but this is not a terrible <laughs> thing. But, but certainly on, on that particular subject, my granddad, when he was demobbed, um, got back to Nottingham. And he, because he'd been a career soldier, he needed to do something like about six months more and he would have qualified for a full army pension, which was, you know, just e even then was not to be sniffed at. And it, it, it gives, again, this is one of these things you reconstruct because uh, I knew my grandmother had fallen out with him terribly at the end of the war be because he, rather than stomach another six months of peacetime, you know, he wouldn't have been... He'd, he had such a stomach full of it yeah. that he he just said, no, I don't care. And he never cared about money, actually. It's that, you know, the simple things. 
and he went off and started a uh, a rose nursery. He started growing roses right. uh, with with another guy who actually, in typical fashion, looked after the business, made all the money. Um, still, still going to this day, you know, and they and they they have quite a good sort of garden center and mail order business that they they run. But my memory of him is just stood in the front garden growing roses, which he gave out to everybody for, you know, a mile around. Everybody would have a rose from from him because he just sort of walked around and uh, and dished them out. It's a terrible business model. Yeah, but there was something else going on, right? You know, he, he knew mm. something and mm. he was... I love that because I really I can sense that now, you know, and I I met that kind of feeling in people as a kid, but I didn't understand it. That's but now it. I can look back and I know, yeah, these people knew something. Yes. They knew what mattered. They knew they just knew what how precious life was and what mm. was a good way to spend your time. You know, growing something growing, you know, life. And something beautiful and something that brings joy and happiness to people you know that what else you're going to do that's mm -hmm. a great way to spend your time um yeah i love that i mean it's one of those it just like in many different art forms you know often hard times and and really traumatic things can produce on the other side a sort of reaction that creates beauty but Mm. I'm not saying that's always necessary, but um, it it does kind of, well, even in our personal lives, you know, when you have a brush like that with something like death quite up close. Or yeah. Real, well, energy, uh, it, it puts life into focus, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Is that, is it the second law of thermodynamics where... I don't no, know I'm not familiar with those laws. I mean, I mean apart from, you know, in a kind of very real... Experience. Well, it's, that, it's just that simple idea that no energy is wasted in nature. Right. Yeah. You know, something bad happens. Yeah, conservation of energy, yeah. There's a reaction to every, every action. Yeah. So. Mm. so let's let's come right up to now then. We've been in the past, but... Uh, Here we have yeah what what's kind of really what's at the forefront of your sort of awareness and what's really kind of living for you right now uh well i i um i guess a bit a bit like yourself since since um this whatever this lockdown this this pandemic whatever was announced talking of monumental you know, big things in society and effects on little people. Uh, I, I kind of um, decided it was a time to get on with the things I'd been meaning to get on with. Um, and I had actually already sold a, a business um, about six months before then and was kind of having those ideas anyway. Um, and then the lockdown meant that I there were various things I couldn't do in terms of just earning a living, like for lots of people. And I had started writing a book about three or four years before, um, which I'd got quite a long way into and huge amounts of material. But I, I'd never really, I, I knew um, in a, in a fairly generalized way, what I wanted it to be about, but I hadn't really thought about the, the angle, you know, what, what I was trying to do with it. So I, uh, I basically threw myself into that. And we, I think we were talking before we switched the cameras on about um, things that we, you know, did at our art school and, and the things that projects, unfinished projects, things that you wanted to do. So I so I I, um, I have a little workshop in Norwich and I started making some paintings and writing and I started doing that about a year ago and I uh, and funnily enough talking of growing things the, the other thing I've been doing is is I, I got an allotment and I've been gardening and those um, are the that that is more or less what I do occasionally I have to do the odd job which gets in the way to earn uh, a few pounds here and there. That doesn't happen very often at the moment. So um, 
I'm, what I'm trying to do, what I'm hoping to do is that I can turn some of that energy out of those three things into something that sustains me as well. Um, and so I'm, I'm about a year and maybe three quarters of a first draft into this book that I'm writing. And I've made that the main thing because I, I just thought you have to have a main thing. You've got to have one thing that you're going to kind of come back to whatever, you know. And I, and I wanted to, to sort of achieve something out of it. I haven't given myself a real time definite commitment, but, um, but you know, stick, stick with it, show up, keep going and try and get something valuable out of it at, at the end of it, really. Uh, so they're, they're the main things. Yeah. So what is it about words then? What is it about writing? And what, what particular kind of writing is it that, that draws you in and fascinates you? That's a good ele elemental question. What, what is it about words? Mm. I've always liked words. When I was a kid, I used to say words over and over again. Um, I think I, I used to imagine words had a sort of shape, that they, they were tangible things. Um, having said that, uh, as far as, it's not exactly a sort of poetic book. I'm, I mean, I'm writing, it's non-fiction. Um, and I'm writing, a, it, the book's called Share. Uh, and it's kind of in, in a... Not, not Sonny and Share. Not Sonny, no, not C-H, <laughs> but the S-H, yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's in a, a small tradition of one or two books around similar themes. But actually, there's not, there isn't really a lot of literature directly about sharing as i mean there's lots of there's Karl marx and there's socialism and there's politics and there's things with, with that kind of a bent but this is more of a generalist right. uh, it's like a meditation on one word really mm. so that kind of do you like that sort of limitation because limitation is such a kind of catalyst for creativity isn't it when you have narrow bounds you're much more kind of challenge to create and it in some ways it i find it makes it easier to create something when there's a limitation um i don't know do you do you feel that do you experience that i don't know whether i saw it as a limitation or not um it it's to me it's a really open quite quite a sort of generalist um subject um, but in a way, I suppose, I suppose the way I think of it is I, I just decided about five years ago that the way to tr try and produce something of value would be to think about more or less the same thing for, for a really long time. That's what I mean by limitation, by yeah. closing. Yeah, so I, yeah. yeah, I suppose it's, it's, but it's not a narrow focus, you know. It's it's um, it's deceptively wide. But but technically, if if you're really writing a book about one word, it, then instinctively you would think that it is limiting, you know. And it, maybe it is. Um, it's 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 been very odd. I mean, I I've been writing. As I said, I've been working on this probably for four years, but writing it for about six months and um i played around with the structure of the thing so many times you know i've written sections and uh it's actually only when i gave up on the idea of a structure that i got one mm. um, and it's a, and i'm writing it non-sequentially which is really helpful so i I'm, I'm sort of trying to get to the point where if something is in your head i really sit down and write that now you know um and so what like you write you write the bits that come up and you don't worry about where they fit into the hole until later or well i do now but i i'd written a sort of skeleton of a book in a very traditional academic way first right. so i'd i'd gone through everything that i thought should be in it you know and everything that i'd kind of found and done i'd done the literature review and i'd seen what other people had said about the subject and i kind of did all that so I sort of knew that I was working back to 
I suppose seeing what you can add of yourself, if it's a bit like, like a painting sometimes or a drawing, you know, you, you do the basics and so, in some ways they're almost the same for everybody to some extent. And it's not, you have to work very, very hard for a long time before you just get to put a few inflections and you, you put a little bit of your own stamp. You know, you, you can't really do that from the beginning because you're acknowledging all these other things and contributions and so I'm not quite there yet. It's still pretty much hard work at the moment. So what? How, tell us a bit more about what your actual experience of writing is then. How does it, how do you actually experience the writing? Um, you know, what are you, yeah, just talk, cause you know, you know it all so well that it just seems obvious to you. You say, oh, I'm writing, but, but what does that mean? What do you actually do? How does it actually come about? What are you experiencing when you're doing it? Good question. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's interesting. I mean, a lot of the process of writing is no, is noticing how how you're moved to, to want to put pen to paper or fiddle on a keyboard or whatever it is you want to say. Um, it's kind of noticing how that shifts, and that and that actually is where your point about limitations is a good one because you know if I don't know if you're anything like me, but I have the attention span of a gnat. I mean, I, I am a general kind of thinker and I think in terms of systems often, but in lots of different ways and I flip from one thing to another. So, so in that sense, it's a discipline. It is, it is actually a discipline because you sort of realize how hard you, you if, if you're working well at anything i think you, you you really become extremely appreciative of the work that's gone into anything that that is vaguely influential or or perhaps similar or or, or you know relates to what you're doing um because it's an incredibly slow process writing and i know i'm amazed that people do you know i know people do churn out novels and in a matter of a week or somebody told me that um kipling wrote one of his books in three days i have no idea if that's true but but you know probably a myth um just to piss you off that's, <laughs> not, that's kind of myth off, just yeah. to make you feel bad <laughs> yeah that, that worked nicely that actually now you mention it yes <laughs> So yeah, but but you're get you're giving me like a general talk on writing. I want to know what your experience. How do you do? You have like a routine. Do you sit down and say, right, I'm going to write for an hour, or I'm going to sit here for an hour and see what I can do? I what do do a bit process? of that. Yeah, I do a bit of that. I mean, I've made uh, a, a kind of home office, and I've got an office where I go and work as well. But I find um, I'm sort of working all the time. I I, I work from when I get up. I, most if I have a sort of problem to solve I tend to write very early in the morning so between six and ten is really fertile because if if you've been perhaps working at something for days even weeks sometimes and, and you haven't solved the thing sometimes you get little eureka moments uh, sometimes you think you do and you can't really realize it and, and other times you really do and then you have to put in the legwork and try and sort of convey what you figured out you know as you say you who thinks they know it all because you've been focusing on this subject matter and then the second you start to write you find you're writing about something else as well that's like lots of uh any creative process you know so so there's always a bit of a dialogue between what you what you think you should be saying particularly in in a um when you're writing non-fiction there's that sense that you should be saying something if you see what i mean it's you can't just play with me you can't it's not like a sculptor playing with materials or it's not really abstract um but I, I, I that's where having the limitation is good because it's quite hard i've realized to 
to stray uh, away from the subject. So sometimes because you've got a, a limited, um, you might edit stuff out, but, but sometimes just going with some of the more unusual thoughts or the kind of abstruse stuff is, is quite fertile, you know, just letting things go. Um, I, I write a lot in indexes. I have about 12 files open. So I, I write, I have a kind of subject index, which I use for those moments when you think you're saying one thing and then you realize it's something else. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So I kind of cast that off and say, well, I won't do that now, but that's, we'll follow that one, you know. And then th that's the kind of keeping yourself on point thing. Um, and then I got all kinds of glossaries. It's, it's amazing, actually. I think for different projects, you invent different systems. But I, I find I'm writing in about 12 files. I, I have to open up 12 files to, to get through the process. Um, so, yeah, it's, it depends what you're doing. But there's a diff I think there's a different process for each project, whatever it is. Right. Yeah, because I there's that thing of the creativity of it, as in you start with an idea like oh, I'm going to write this today. Um, my experience, whenever I've written anything, is as soon as I start writing, then it becomes its own thing. Yeah, it's not that. It, it it's a it's a feedback loop. It's like yeah. as soon as I put something down, it changes everything about what I was thinking and it actually alter it's like a conversation or something it alters mm. what I might have thought or something appears out of nowhere yeah and that's more interesting than what I thought I was writing about and yeah I guess you can get lost in that I mean part it depends it depends what your kind of aim is I suppose but you can get lost in that. Yeah. That's what I've learned through through writing this particular book, because as I say, it's strictly nonfiction. I mean, there's lots about fiction and there, there probably are fictitious elements, but But everything's fiction, right? I know. Well, there, there's a bit about that as well. But you but you actually are right. You can't sometimes you can't do that. You can't be seduced by that. So it took it took me about nine months and then I got a system. I finally got what I call it an organizing principle. And it kind of looks obvious in most books. You, you kind of, you know, like these popular psychology or philosophy books, they've got a whole section in Waterstones. Which I think they call it smart, smart thinking or something like that. Do you know the kinds of, yeah, the I know what where the futurologists put all their stuff and, and uh, new ideas get introduced. And, and, and I guess it is, I'm, I'm sort of trying to write in that vein. Um, and they usually look a bit like pseudo academic books. I'm being very dismissive of the whole genre of fiction now, but but very often what you see is a kind of I don't mean pseudo in a negative way, but you know you'll see perhaps three or four headings and then subheadings, and they use some kind of indexing off referencing system, and it's kind of popular academic writing. And I was trying to emulate that and thought I had the whole thing blocked in and I'm going to write about this, 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 and this. And then these have all these elements. And I got to a point after about six months of writing and I just realized that they kept changing endlessly and that didn't work. And I spent, I, I really went off the idea. I really, you know, I spent two or three weeks just thinking about that and nothing else. Didn't write anything. Just walk around thinking about that more or less and, and looking at bits of the book and thinking, why doesn't it work? And I, and I did have a moment and I, I looked at the way other people had done it and I got these three things. I decided it was about people and it was about systems and it was about stuff. And I tested it out and it, it sort of worked for a week and then I wrote for another week and it still worked and I've stuck with it. And touch wood, that seems to work through all the different processes. And and it's not that I've got three parts where, you know, there's a, a write about people then sit, because it's not that simple. But as an orienting thing, in your, an or, it's an organizing principle. Yeah, so yeah. In, in your head, that moment when you're lost, you can sort of cross reference and say, well, am I mainly, is this about people? Is it about a system or is it about, a you know, value or something that's produced, you know? And it's kind of works. So ever since I got to there, I, I've been 
quite methodically work in a way and you know I, I can do three or four hours a day of actual writing and I do my research when I'm out walking the dog and I listen to podcasts and I gather in lots and, and I do some stuff like this where I talk to people you know um, and it touch wood it's it's it feels like it's rolling now it's 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 going you know yeah it's it's an interesting it brings up this just this idea of creation in general and i suppose over the years i've come to realize that if i if i loosen the control a little bit on what is happening if i mm -hmm. if i allow in this the thing itself to mm. to be kind of co-piloting the direction mm. then often what comes out of that is much better or maybe always in fact in my experience mm. and and usually when something fails it's because i thought i knew what it was at the start and i tried to make it fit that mm. but it's kind of like well that isn't what creation is creation is it's like a seed you 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 have the seed which is the idea but then you plant it well then all kinds of things happen weather happens there's well, a drought see, there's a flood there's I, a fucking huge hair chewing on the roots yeah. Yeah. well you you're in you're in chaos uh, you know um uh calm and chaos some, something in between the two but um i think I agree with you and I think what's interesting about this is that you've got both things you you have to have that but you also have to know when to just to stop it you know and, and say no no now we because I think there's two things here but sometimes you're being creative but but sometimes you're actually reporting and they're two different functions so there's a kind of responsibility to report something. If, if, you, if you've been somewhere or figured something like a correspondent goes out to Libya or somewhere, you really, your concern is that what I have seen has to get into the eyes and ears and minds of as many people as I can in a way that is as close to how I experienced it, because that's all I've got, you know, that's all I can offer. And that's... Um, and I think that's not strictly a creative process. So, so what's what I find interesting about writing this is that it's part, it, half of it is the thing you're talking about, and the other half is knowing when to reel that in, you know, and put a muzzle on it and say, no, actually, this is this is the stuff, this is the salient, and and these th these things just need to be said, or um, there might be some boring facts, you know. Uh, and the and and the for me what I'm learning about it is the art of and there are some great non-fiction writers who tell stories. Um, I mean, Bill Bryson's not everybody's cup of tea, but I think he's a real genius in in that he kind of invented the genre of of storytelling non-fiction. You know, everything he writes is a sort of little serialized story, and and he, it's about keeping readers' attention and. Um, be, kind of being attentive to whoever's reading the thing. Yeah. Well, you know, but part of, of writing something is there's got to be a responsibility to make it readable, right? Yes, so, well, exactly, yeah. And uh, lots of people forget people. that. I mean, there are millions of books that are fucking awful to read, yeah. right? And I it's know. I know. tedious, yeah. and I think that's Let's probably make another the, one. Most, the most important thing, because if it isn't mm. accessible in that way, you've already lost most of your audience. So, mm. and the thing about story is it's the oldest mm. form of communicating that we have. And it's, it's so rich and deep mm. and it's actually probably, it's the most essential part of spoken or written communication. It's, it's well, kind of like how we actually do communicate is through story. So the further you are from pure storytelling, the more difficult it's going to be to deliver what you're delivering. So, and somebody like, yeah, Bill Bryson, who just has kind of mastered that art form, really. Mm. And that there's almost, you know, kind of, I guess there's probably a lot of um, 
high-minded literary types that think that's all a bit too common and 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 kind of easy to digest but fuck if it works it works if you can get right into somebody because you've you've mesmerized them by the power of storytelling yeah then great because then you can deliver whatever you're delivering directly yes they're open and they welcome it you know they're not you're not fighting with the reader or well it it works it works as a method but but what you're talking about it's actually i i give probably half of a whole chapter to because um you know this guy i, just, I read his book over christmas oh yeah yeah i sort of I, I i had a kind of little bit of a a read of that but i i just got fed up with it i think no it's hugely popular and i can see why and i just i wanted to reference it but but he was on the radio talking and somebody bought me this book for christmas but he was talking about what you were talking about really which is this idea of the only reason that we, human beings achieve anything is is out of our ability to um tell each other stories um which is quite an interesting perspective and uh you know if you're writing a book about sharing the idea of being able what makes you human is this idea of being able to share the same belief story and that actually until you can do those things you cannot collaborate with other other groups and and you know his point is that's why most of the animal kingdom are not and i'm not necessarily agreeing with him on this but but this is the point that he he makes you know it's one of the things that distinguishes us and, and why we are so sophisticated is narrative which is pretty kind of easy, easy to 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 be persuaded by um yeah i don't know I, mean, I don't know if i think that we're sophisticated at all given the the way things are going i, I, I wouldn't say superior or or but but i think sophistication in a positive or a negative way it could be sophistication right. yeah, sure. to be sophisticated enough to end your own existence in five minutes is yeah whether sophisticated but we're just tied up in words aren't we that's what we do sure yeah it's about the story thing. I mean, story is kind of the origin of culture, not the origin, but it's one of the main ingredients, isn't it? Because I think landscape is actually place mm. is is the the beginning of culture, and then you have the stories are like a next level up, maybe. It's pick, pick a belief system, really, isn't it? In the beginning was the word. If if you go with that. Um, a lot, lot of tribal if, if you talk to aborigines it's a it's a much more pictorial kind of landscape based i think all culture comes out of the land whether they whether the people yeah. know it or not i mean they may be in their heads yeah but but they're they're living in bodies in a place you know i well that's where the that's where the concept of sharing begins you know you know the the idea of the plowshare tell me no well if you if you do the kind of etymology on it, which I do a bit of, um, the word sharing in in English comes from skier, s k e r, uh, which is kind of I think it's Indo, it's described as Indo Germanic. There's lots of language ways and roots around the world, and but the oldest version of of that um, basically means to cut. So when you talk about giving people a cut, you know, you, you're kind of saying the same thing. Um, but the plowshare, the, the, the share was the first tool that was attached to anything that cut the land. So it's that first little, usually a kind of heart shaped blade that goes into the soil and it, sh it literally shares the soil. So that's a good sort of analogy for your idea that you begin with with land um interesting yeah but that's obviously land that's landscape after farming because we may not have had a whether we have a sharing concept before that is, is deep waters mm. well i guess i guess we did because if you lived as we did in small groups then you shared that was it was all it was there was there was no possibility not to unless you went off on your own 
left the tribe, but life probably became extremely hard very quickly if you did that. So it's, you know, it's probably as, as old as we are, in fact. I would think so, yeah. Of sharing. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's interesting that we kind of, yeah, that when we got into agriculture, that it was right in there at the start, even if it didn't become that, because once, you know, things developed and, 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 and roles separated, then the sharing kind of some of, you know, some people were getting more shares than others and, uh, so things got a little bit more complicated, didn't it? You know, it's kind of how the book goes. Um, um, but but I'm luckily there's previous literature. I mean, you know, people have written about this, and you know, there's some good research that tells you when sharing gained certain meanings. So so you know, up until probably 1930, it was uh, it was just just distribution. The idea of a share was a was from that cutting you know you make two things out of one and that that it didn't really have any other use until about 1930 and then um what happened in 1930 was there's a group called the oxford group um and i'm getting this information from a guy called nicholas john who actually wrote a book called the age of sharing and the the oxford group were an american christian group who, who basically kind of started the idea of an encounter group. I don't know if you've ever come across this, uh, if, you've, if you've heard of that, but... No, an encounter, I've heard, of, I've heard of it, but I don't know what it is. Well, well what, what, he, what the guy who wrote that book argues is that sharing, it's this idea of layers of meaning that a word can suddenly take on more and more and more meaning. So in 1930, with this Oxford group, they, I think they were quite an evangelical kind of group and what they invented if you like was the idea of an encounter and that part of the worship thing became about publicly sharing pain which is the idea of you know i'm i'm liam and i'm an alcoholic or i'm i'm this and actually what came from two, two of those members of that group went on to found alcoholics anonymous so what we kind of know as therapy, culture, and, and all of those things, and the idea of sharing your feelings mm. pretty much stems back to that point in time, which kind of relates to what we were saying about grandparents and the idea of not talking about. Mm. That, that was in 1930, that was still quite a contentious thing. And there were lots of strong criticisms from the higher up echelons of the church that this was a low church thing to do you know it's profane really you didn't do it in the church um anywhere near the altar it, and they, it got a lot of criticism so that so that was the first time sharing became about you know caring feelings uh, you share something that you feel and then that kind of um, evolved, you know, and you have psychoanalysis and you've got the 60s and the 70s. And then technology then brings in this idea of sharing as telling or publishing. So, you know, like now everywhere you look, if you click your phone, you know, and, and somebody says, thanks for sharing, it means that you've, um, it means that you've sent something you've read to somebody else or to another Casting, yeah. place. Yeah, it's it's kind of really questionably, it, 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 it's, it sort of stretches the idea of sharing to a, gets, gets to a bit where it might kind of snap. Um, so the, there's, there's a sort of idea, of, and then a guy, there's a, the, I, I can't remember the chap's name, it's, in, it, you know, obviously written about this, but a guy kind of analyzed the idea of a dead metaphor, which is quite a powerful idea, which is to say that if you if a term gets overladen with meaning, it reaches a threshold where it just loses all meaning, it doesn't have any meaning. So that's an, an interesting point. I try, I'm, I'm, I'm quite convinced that that has happened with the idea of sharing. And I'm trying to get us to a place in, in the book where we kind of jump off that cliff and then we start breaking it all down and, and go, well, what do we mean? What are we actually saying in all these different cases? And, um, and then reestablishing a meaning and all, and all, you know, it's almost kind of marshalling language around. Uh, 
when it's 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 broken <laughs> it's sort of broken down a bit that's interesting because i feel like there's a lot of dead language there's a lot of stuff that's lost its meaning because it's just been overused or or underused or yeah or just or just used in totally different ways by so many people that it has no meaning there's no shared meaning of something mm. Mm. so you know you could take a word like a really sort of current contentious word like racism i don't mm. think racism as a lot of people use it now means the same thing that i understood racism to mean when i was younger it's like no. it's it's it you know and 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 there's lots of jarring kind of misunderstandings yep. and it's as if language itself is going through this kind of collapse in a way, which is quite interesting. It's almost like everything is being touched by the shifts that are going on, which is... the, the best phrase I heard this week to describe that was um, by a, a, a woman in a university. I think she was in Singapore and she just said, um, meaning has been atomized hmm. which i thought was a really good concise way of explaining what's and, that, and that's she, she's talking about the idea that when you have a context of meaning so say before the internet you know at least if you read a newspaper article you could only interact with that article on that page and it was only shared with you by the publisher so the contract of, of who's writing it, where am I reading it, who's it about, those things, the context for the meaning was set. Mm -hmm. And there was a kind of chalk line, whereas now there's so much sharing of so-and-so said something about so-and-so and this kind of almost playground sort of attitude um, that when people, by the time meaning arrives in someone's inbox or on their feed or in their tray or on their phone, the meaning is atomized. What, what you get is a, is a usually often a pejorative or, or a version of something that, that maybe had an origin, but, but it's been taken and used pro probably for, for another purpose you know or for many purposes like it there's lots of people yeah deliberately fucking with information and misleading there's people just having fun with it and yeah. there's everything in between mm. there's people totally misunderstanding something and interpreting it in another way and all of these things are happening simultaneously so it's like this it is an atomization i think that's a good word because it's what's happening to everything if you think about society itself, it's being atomized. Everyone is breaking down into their constituent individual part selves. And it's almost like, to me, that's like a necessary condition for something new to reform is that you have to dissolve everything first yeah. and create a kind of primordial soup again on yeah. in all those ways, language, society, meaning, identity all of it you know absolutely and i mean it, it it seems like a very natural process like it we're just dissolving <laughs> well i think it's natural but potentially dangerous you know or potentially um yeah. uh you know it has um a lot of significance it could be for good could be like we were talking about you know no energy is lost it's it's but, but when it's happening on a big scale you can reasonably expect that wherever it's going something big scale is and i think that's what you, know, you were talking about this early you know there's this sort of sense at the moment that we might just be living through quite significant times you know and, and it feels like there are choices and and possibilities uh but yeah, atomization, oversharing. We, wild not... and, and wild opportunities, like, you know, bizarre opportunities, I think, as well, mm -hmm. as well as like deadly threats. There's, there's the kind of, it's like the rain, the dynamic range of life is opening up and there's all this kind of choice and possibility and things could be incredibly blissfully unexpectedly amazing or they could be dire and terminal and you know apocalyptic 
and or maybe all of those things at the same time who knows but well in a way it doesn't it, matter does it because it, no, no. it, even if that isn't the case in reality it only matters that if enough of us think it is well yeah sure then it is so so that's what's interesting is is this kind of oh there used to be a website called oversharing.com it was more of a jokey take on all this stuff you know people kind of going to the nth degree to to tell people all about their lives or um just do really unnecessary pointless things just to be in the public domain just just to be seen yeah there's a lot of that well hey to bring it to come back down into our bodies and the ground mm -hmm. um literally the ground so tell me about your growing and gardening and what the relationship because the reason i ask this is because I find if I spend too much time in my head oh, yeah. doing on the computer, yeah. I go nuts. I need to be outside in yeah. my body, in the land with, you know, with all the life going on, a part of that really yeah. kind of getting my hands in it. And I find that there's something really rich about that balance. I can't think. You kind of asked me the question and answered it yourself. Yeah, well, well, I want to, you know, add anything to it. That's exactly what it's about. It's just, yeah. you know, diff it, the one complements the other because it's a completely different. But in some ways, it's different. But but actually, that it's back to that thing when you said, you know, you put something down on paper and you think it's in your head. As soon as you make the physical act of putting it down, it's something else. Mm. Well, it's the same thing with with writing or, or even painting, you know, if, if you need to, to reflect on it and think about it, you do something else. Mm. Um, and that was a saying, there was a writer who said that if, if you want to write about something, write about something else. Mm. I think it's a relatively well known expression. So yes, yeah, just about getting away and diff using different parts of, of you. Yeah, that's it. It's the fullness of it's not enough. I couldn't spend all day on a computer and just do that. That it, That's a kind of dead feeling. I do sometimes. <laughs> but, but probably not the next day. Yeah, I, I always feel a bit ill if I do too much of anything. You know, it, it just, I know there's a kind of knowing that, okay, that's enough. So yes. move on. And it is, it, it, it is that experiencing the full range of being alive in a way mm. you know like so there's this whole realm of connection and conversation that that is one dimension and then there's in my own head thoughts words poetry writing which is another thing and then there's a kind of more emotional like music or painting mm. you know they're they're sort of they're different. I mean, painting is very sensual to me. It's a very physical thing. It's a very, and I'm saying this only having just started painting after 25 years or whatever, but I know I've known this all along about painting. It's so sensual and I am a very sensual person. And that's what really draws me in. It's the actual paint itself. It's the, it's the physical process of doing it that, that draws me in and there's an emotional dimension to it there's a kind of feeling there's a language of feeling about it as well which maybe comes from doing it you know from doing the physical and the visceral thing and and perhaps working because i make things you know i also make mm -hmm. i'm a maker and i i'm and i do spend time in the woods here you know working with the land and growing things and you know working with trees a lot mm. and those are much more physical but they they almost have a kind of what i might call a spiritual dimension they're like physical like deeply physical but mm. also quite elevated at the same time and there's all these different combinations of heart, body, mind, soul, or whatever, that these different activities seem to kind of bring up in different proportions or quantities. So sometimes it's the activity. Do you not think sometimes you can just apply a different bit of yourself to the medium or to the action? Because, I mean, I could write in a very sensual way or I could write in a very mechanical way. 
And I could, I could probably do the same thing with a painting. And, and what I like about any of those processes is this, the difference in process is probably easier to be sensual if you're drawing, you know, because it's gestural and there's less, you're not applying concepts and things, but it's maybe less analytical, but it depends how you do it. But I mean, the for me, the challenge is when you, you try and bring all of those um, processes or, or attitudes, qualities to bear on one thing because then it's in it's in the thing that you're making whether it's a piece of and it might be more than what you know if it's a film it could be a piece of writing it could be sculpture all at the same time whatever it is you're working on is trying to get the balance of all those different sort of feelings you know physicality and something a bit more poetic but then something very honest and, and that reporting you know the real realist sense of of of, of that um might not always be possible, but if you can get a balance of those things, that can be very powerful. But I think, you know, you're, set, you're setting your sights pretty high because it's, I mean, I've decided I'm making a, a piece of writing, you know, because it's it's hard to apply that across different areas. Yeah, that is, that's a really interesting idea, actually, to, I never thought of it like that. I'm just kind of thinking when I was describing that before, I was thinking about what I experience when I do those things, rather than attempting to do them in a certain way, which I don't know that I've ever done that, like intentionally, okay, I'm going to try and go and work on the land with, and meet it in all those different ways. Um, well, or, one at a time. Like saying, or, or make a piece of writing or, but it's an interesting exercise to perhaps try like, okay, what if I actually try and bring these things to it or not even so much try, but switch on that part of myself yeah. rather yeah. than, yeah. So yeah. like, okay, let me feel, let me write something, but actually spend more time being aware of how I'm feeling. Yeah. In my yes, body. your own mode of being, your own attitude and approach to, to what you sort of, I, I only thought of that because you asked me the question about what, when you said, what's your process? What, why, why, what do you do with words you know it's a, that, that elemental kind of and i thought then actually what when it's really working well you've got the kind of reporting going on but you haven't forgotten about the actual words and and you can use metaphor and you can use the sound of words and it you know and, and also mechanically you're thinking about the organization of the thing which is a building thing you know it's a kind of practical layering or or whatever that that is and if you can apply all of those definitely to a piece of writing and i think you can apply it to anything i think it happens in painting and sculpture and gardening De definitely in gardening so when it's really going well for you how do you know <laughs> that it's really going well can you just very 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 occasionally you you just get that immersive feeling you just realize that you're totally engrossed in, in in a process, but it, at a very specific point in, and you know where you've come from, and you know just for that moment where you're going to, and you and you are completely kind of conversant with that bit. You know, it's very you you don't maintain that feeling, and you you then spend three or four days. You might have three or four weeks, and and you're probably not going to write anything of any value you know but but then you kind of get to the point and it i don't know it just it, it it's a repet it's it's um it's a kind of punct punctuation you can't it's a bit like you said you sort of have to let it come to you but you also have to show up and apply yourself so it's a bit a bit of both okay so that's how it happens but how do you actually experience it what does it do know like? just immersion it's just immersion it's just a feeling that you, you're, um, for a very, usually quite fleetingly, you are actually in control of something. That, and that's very fleeting, actually. Um, and that is, a, that is that, that's, to me, that's good. That's creative, you know, because I, I don't know about you, but I don't walk around under the illusion that I control very much any of the time. So when I can very fleetingly get the feeling and feel like I've earned it, 
you know, actually feel like you've applied a bit of craft and you've, you've done some learning, you've done some research. And if you're in the garden, you know, you kind of learned how to use a pair of secretaires or whatever it is, that it all comes together. And, you know, in a garden, it's when you eat the apple, but in a piece of right, some, sometimes you just, you know, you, you feel like you're doing something of value. It's pretty fleeting. <laughs> well, it's, <laughs> it's fascinating that, it fits together. That, you, that you describe it as, as a feeling of control because my experience is probably the opposite, the opposite. That, where, <laughs> where when it's really working for me, mm. I, it's not me anymore at all. It's like I'm experiencing, I'm witnessing this thing happening this mm. deeply deeply satisfying is mm. it's kind of blissful it's like it's a bit like a dance it's like a choreography where everything mm. is just happening as it should and there's nothing to do there's no sense of it being me doing it or there's a kind of effortless beauty to mm. it that is completely satisfying yeah, well, the weird, yeah. weird, weird thing is, I, I kind of recognise that as well. So you know, you, maybe it's just how we describe things, but um, and maybe there's a, an element of the of the medium, you know, maybe that 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 does play a bit of a bit of a part, because um, you know, free free, like what's the word for free? free association, right? You know, if you're, you're doing a kind of Ginsberg or something, you, automatic writing or whatever, um, might, might be the kind of feeling that you're trying to achieve that, you know, you, that writers have talked about those ideas in writing. But if you know that the form you're in is, is a piece of uh, nonfiction, it's very hard. And yeah, even then there are moments because you can construct a space to write like that, even in something like what I'm doing. So I, I, I sometimes construct scenarios and I'll go into this ridiculous fiction where I'm addressing someone who's not there and I, and I make up a character and talk to them. And even though it's a factual book and, and, I, and I try and stretch the bounds a bit because you wouldn't expect to see that in a nonfiction book. But I'm quite, I mean, I admire people like Lewis Hyde, you know, who, who they're quite, they're academic, but they're quite sort of spiritual in the things that, the way that they write and the ideas that they take on. Um, so it's that idea of not not being bound by the idea of a form, you know, and, and not worrying about where you're going to sit on a shelf or, you know, how it's going to come over or just just in your own terms, trying to convey whatever it is that you, you're trying to do. Mm. Yeah, and I guess, you know, that thing you were saying before about bringing the, this sort of balance of all these different elements of yourself into it so that for the reader they can access it because it touches them on different levels it's not just purely intellectual it's you know it's got other levels too yeah i know i'm failing still on that that one we're, we're all going to fail on that one to some extent but i think you know that's maybe where story again where storytelling is 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 deceptive because it's so deep but it seems so simple, you know, like a, any kind of myth or tale or something that's been around for a long time. They're kind of, on the surface, they seem really simple and childish, you know, but they're so layered and deep, those things. That that particular method and mechanism mm. is so much a part of who we are. It forms such a, a part of who we are that and it's so rich and, and reveals, you know, it's like any great story. You can hear it as a kid and hear one thing. And then at a different point in your life, you'll take something else from it because yep. it's stacked up with so many different meanings for different people. And it can be delivered to a group of people around a fire by one person talking. And yep. all the people in that space will take something different depending on what's going on in their life at that moment. Yeah. It has that kind of lock and key thing. And yet individual. If it's really good, whatever they take and whatever they think it's about, that moment of delivery will work because there's also something 
slightly formal about it. There's some just understanding of the words and that it's a, you know, it's a spoken medium. So, God, it's very easy to forget that when you're writing kind of heady academics. You know, it's so easy to slip into. Um, I was about to say to forget that. <laughs> well, it's, for me, it's the hardest thing in this form. The the, the thing that I've try, tried to do is my, my mate was asking me questions about this, and we got into a conversation a bit like this, quite deep. And he said at one point, so that's really interesting. He said, could you explain that to my 14 year old niece? And I hadn't met his 14 year old niece at that point, but I said, actually, do you know what? That's exactly what this has got to do. That's my, mm-hmm. you've just given me the kind of design brief is I can do anything, but if I'm alienating his 14 year old niece, um, it's not working. Because especially if you're talking about, if, if you're trying to talk about big ideas and future and, you know, if you're trying to tell a 14-year-old what maybe you've learned as a 52-year-old, I mean, they're the guys that are going to have to fix all this stuff or do, do whatever it is that needs to be done. So um, what's the, we're talking to them. What's the point of what you think you know if you can't communicate it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's it, you know, surely. You know? It's it's pretty worthless. So, yeah, good good to remember that, isn't it? With everything, I guess, you know, if you are kind of in the business of sharing something. Mm. Cool. Well, maybe... I, sure I like what you did. Mm? If you're in the business of sharing something. Yeah. There you go. That was for you. That was a little little parting gift. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's what we call a soundbite in the media, you know. Yeah, deadly. Ugh. Yeah, well, that sort of feels like an end to me. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Thanks for uh, for showing up and and it, Thank you. I'm really I'm kind of seeing more now why Keith sort of suggested we meet up because there's lots of overlap there in our you know in our experience and what we're interested yeah. in so yes i got that it's okay. great to find out you're in norwich because you're not far away so um there'll probably a, a chance for us to meet up at some point that would be good yeah, yeah. i have to yeah, get like you over here to see the woods well if you are coming up to visit keith at some point i'm just around the corner from him so maybe we can okay. go walk together or something like that That'd be that quite sounds nice. like a grand idea yeah. i know for a fact that i'm up there as it happens on the 20 i think it's the 25th or 26th i've got to take my van for some work up in north norfolk so i'm, I'm going to have three or four hours to kill but we might find another time yeah sounds good yeah i'd be up for that all right lean well good to meet you and you, yeah. Thanks for the pr- 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 probing questions. I'll, I'll go away and have a week's <laughs> analysis now. Okay. Well, you know, don't analyze too much. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, I really mean that. Yeah. Cool. All right. We'll take care, and thanks hopefully, see you soon. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Good.